Hello, my name is Sean Car Lopez, and I'm here to, today to talk to you about the importance of lowering blood pressure in the hopes of decreasing cardiovascular risk. As pharmacists, we know very well that increases in blood pressure have been associated with increasing patients' likelihood of having stroke and heart attack. And in addition to that, we know that high blood pressures can also increase patients' likelihood of having renal failure and congestive heart failure. We also have a tremendous information load with the number of trials that have been published in the treatment of hypertension with both diuretics and beta blockers that patients who control their blood pressure have a much lower incidence of stroke and heart attack. Well, having said all this, the first question that we have to ask ourselves is, do our patients really understand this? And as we're working in pharmacies and have patients come in with prescriptions for antihypertensive therapy, and we ask patients, what did your doctor tell you this medication is for? Very frequently they're able to tell us, this is my blood pressure pill. Um, but when you further ask them, why is it important that you take this pill? Oftentimes patients really cannot come up with a good answer. So we as pharmacists have to do a much better job in helping patients understand the reason for wanting to lower blood pressure. Um, I like to share with them information about just minor lowering of blood pressure. For example, 5 to 6 millimeters of blood pressure reduction can produce in them a 40% reduction in the incidence of stroke. As you'll notice on the first slide here, um, this is some follow-up information from the Framingham data. And you can see very nicely that increases in blood pressure certainly correlate very strongly with the increased risk of cardiovascular mortality. And this is true whether we're talking about coronary artery disease in females or males, congestive heart failure in females and males, and then lastly, stroke in men and women. As blood pressures increase, the likelihood that patients will die from these disease states also increase. Well, fortunately for us, the Joint Committee on Evaluation, Detection, and Treatment of High Blood Pressure uh, is available for us in order to help us fully understand the gamut of care that patients with hypertension should receive. First of all, they've categorized very nicely for us when patients have specific readings, both systolic or diastolic, whether or not patients actually have stage 1 or all the way through the gamut of stage 4 hypertension. You'll also see listed here on this slide that there is very specific management strategies that we should adopt. For instance, you'll notice that most of the management strategies incorporate lifestyle modification as an initial step, um, emphasizing for us that hypertension is not something we should view in a vacuum, but one of many cardiovascular risks that these patients have. They also help define when pharmacologic intervention should, should occur. And lastly, they define for us the follow-up that each patient has based on their, their classification. For example, stage 1 patients may not have as soon a follow-up as patients that have stage, for example, stage 4 hypertension. One of the changes that have occurred in the terminology is that we no longer call stage 1 hypertension mild primarily because the first step we would like to have patients adopt in the management of their hypertension would be lifestyle modifications. And in fact, those are very difficult for patients to adopt. So using terminology like mild gave them the impression that maybe it wasn't such a bad thing and, and that didn't give us a lot of great impetus uh, to have patients adopt those difficult lifestyle changes. Now for a patient who's relatively uncomplicated, and that would be a patient who has only hypertension as their cardiovascular risk, their goals for therapy may, may be 140 over 90, which is the current proposed goal of therapy for most patients. However, if we're dealing with a complicated patient, let's say a patient that has both hypertension and diabetes, then our goals must be more stringent. One of the questions, of course, from, that remains is how low should we be going in patients that have hypertension? Part of this debate <clears throat> is fueled by the fact that in the TOMS trial, the treatment of mild hypertension trial, we actually found that patients who had systolic pressures in the mid-120s had better outcomes than patients who had systolic pressures in the mid-130s. And so the question remains, how low and how aggressive should we be in the management of patients' hypertension?
The JNC5 states that lifestyle modifications should be one of the first things we talk about with patients. And this makes sense because when you think about hypertension, it's usually one of maybe several cardiovascular risks that patients are encountering. Maybe they have cholesterol problems or diabetes or, or have smoking along with um, their hypertension. And looking at patients' lifestyle and, and proposing improvements in the way that patients can actually decrease their risk for cardiovascular disease is an extremely important first step. Now you'll see on the slide that there is an overwhelming amount of advice being given here, losing weight if patients are overweight, limiting alcohol intake, doing aerobic exercise regularly, not to exceed six grams of sodium chloride on a daily basis, trying to encourage increased intake of uh, elements like potassium, magnesium, and calcium, stopping smoking, uh, in addition to limiting saturated fat and cholesterol intake. And you can only imagine that if we all had to put ourselves on this type of a lifestyle modification regimen, they would be extremely difficult to, to attain. So what I like to encourage patients to do is maybe pick one that they're willing to work on over several months, and then I, I follow up with them to see how they're doing in, in adopting the new lifestyle modifications. The other important thing for us to remember is while this is considered a first step in patients that have hypertension, we also have to realize that in the long term, lifestyle modification changes are extremely difficult. And so we have to be prepared to, and, um, to help patients adjust to therapy, not just lifestyle modification, but actually pharmacologic interventions as well. The Joint National Committee gave recommendations for how we should um, provide initial pharmacologic interventions if, in fact, patients are not able to make lifestyle modifications in such a way that they no longer need drug therapy. They recommend that two categories of drugs be considered first-line therapy. Those include diuretics and beta blockers. Of course, the first question that many people ask is, well, which one of these two should we select? And fortunately, there is some guidelines out there. If, in fact, you are an elderly person or somebody who has edema as a concurrent problem, then diuretics are a very logical choice. It's important to note, too, that while the thiazide diuretics are first-line therapy, if, in fact, you have a patient with a creatinine clearance of less than 30 mils per minute, then drugs like furosemide would be more appropriate because the thiazide diuretics will have limited efficacy with poor renal function. Now, on the other hand, if in fact we have patients who have concurrent angina or in fact are post-myocardial infarction, then beta blockers would be considered first-line therapy for that particular patient. As pharmacists, we also have to be aware of concerns that may arise with either of these therapies. Um, one red flag that I think is important for pharmacists to key in on is patients who are prescribed doses that are higher than 25 milligrams of hydrochlorothiazide. And this is primarily due to the fact that there is a ceiling effect. In other words, you can push the doses of hydrochlorothiazide, but the additional antihypertensive effects that we get with this therapy really level out at about 25 milligrams. And the second concern that we have for this particular category of drug is the relatively high incidence of impotence that's seen. Now, any time we lower blood pressure in patients, we have the potential to cause impotence. But for some reason, with these particular therapy, um, particularly diuretics, there is a higher incidence of impotence. So pharmacists have to develop a comfort zone and an ability to question patients about this. It would be extremely inappropriate if, in fact, patients were suffering from this side effect and um, did not have other alternative therapy offered to them. Now, the concerns that exist for beta blockers include asthma and COPD. And I'd like to talk a little bit more about the diabetes and congestive heart failure patient. When I was in school, we learned that um, diabetes and, and systolic congestive heart failure were also contraindications to patients um, that, would like, that you might like to place on a beta blocker. What's interesting, though, is the fact that um, some of the data that's come out of the post-myocardial infarction studies have shown that actually patients with diabetes, when you compare them to patients that do not have diabetes, actually do better, derive greater benefits from beta blockade therapy. And the same correlation has been seen for patients that have congestive heart failure, that in fact patients with CHF actually derive greater benefits than from beta blockers than patients that do not have congestive heart failure. So as this information becomes more mainstream and part of prescribing practices, then as pharmacists we have to make sure that patients are started on relatively low doses of beta blockers, titrated up carefully, and that we monitor patients for any worsening of disease states.
some of the basic monitoring parameters that I think are extremely important, whether we're talking about diuretics or beta blockers or any other antihypertensive drug, is that blood pressure should be monitored. And in fact, any time a patient comes into your pharmacy for a refill on their medications would be a great time to check their blood pressure and give them a little bit of feedback on, on how they are with regard to whatever goals they should have. In addition to that, diuretics should also have electrolytes monitored. And if you're not in a, in a situation where you can actually look at the lab values, then you should be asking your patients what their last serum potassium was or if there were any abnormal values the last time their electrolytes were checked. And if, in fact, your patient has gout, then certainly monitoring uric acid levels is also very appropriate. For beta blockers, in addition to monitoring blood pressure for therapeutic efficacy, we also need to make sure we're looking at heart rates and asking patients about the impact of these drugs on their exercise tolerance.